Hello and welcome to Zestology, the podcast all about energy, vitality and motivation. I'm Tony Wright and it's a bit echoey tonight. Normally I record these podcast intros walking out and about in London or wherever I am. Um, But today I'm in my flat and that is because I've recorded an introduction to this podcast and I listened to it back and it's just a bit negative Nancy. I'm not afraid of being negative, um, but yeah, just wasn't happy with it. So I've come inside to record it again. Um, And this podcast is about news and whether it's a good idea to have the occasional switch off from uh, all the media that we consume. Obviously, I work as a sports journalist for Sky Sports News, and I love that. I love sport, and I love reading about sport. I love watching sport, and so on. I'm also a bit of a news junkie as well. Um, I sometimes do shows on Sky News, and I enjoy watching that as well. And every once in a while, I have to ban myself from reading The Guardian on my phone. (laughs) Um, So it's clear that I do consume quite a lot of news. And as well as being a news junkie, I recognise the occasional value of switching off, occasionally, getting home and stepping away from the TV and my phone and everything else. And I think especially at the moment, some stories leave me feeling pretty alarmed right now. You know, the state of the world I care about, it worries me. So today on this podcast, is it ever a good idea to switch off a little? And I want to make it clear, I don't just want news which is solely stories of cats that were lost and found. I think it was the newsreader Martin Lewis who said um, years back, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have a little bit more good news? Stories about cats. I don't actually think he was suggesting stories about cats, but I do think that he wrote a book about cats. I think that's actually true. Um, So I don't just want news bulletins about cats, and I do want to be well informed to make a difference in the world. I like news, and I like consuming news. But I'm just saying, is there ever a role to switch off? And thankfully, I've got the perfect person to talk about this today because Tayo Roxon is my guest on Zestology. On this podcast, we explore the themes of leadership and whether we can make a difference by switching off. And Tayo was on Zestology. We didn't just uh, talk about um, switching off, but I really loved his stuff on mentorship as well and following your gut as well. If you're someone who would love a mentor and hasn't got one at the moment or... Maybe you have got a mentor and you could do with an upgrade, then I think Tyo is good on that as well. And as well as that, he's a thoroughly good man and an excellent guest. So here he is, Tyo Roxon on Zestology. Okay, hello and welcome to Tyo Roxon. Tyo, how are you doing? I'm brilliant. How are you? Yeah, very good. It's nice to talk to you. We've uh, done an interview for your podcast, which I greatly enjoyed. There was a lot of talk of poop poop tweeting, wasn't there? (laughs) Pooping, taking your phone, reading, you know, disengaging from the world. Yeah, (laughs) because, you know, like in the past, that was just a peaceful time where you could just let your your, your thoughts wander. But everyone, (laughs) everyone takes their iPhone now. In fact, isn't there like a massive instance of people dropping their phones down the toilet these days? Because uh, yeah, (laughs) yeah, no, hey, I appreciate you actually, you know, calling me out on that because it is I I, I said in our interview, I'm so guilty of it. And I, you know, I just need to sometimes just take and enjoy the serene moment, you know? (laughs) (laughs) That's all you need. Yeah, just enjoy the serene moment. So now, Tayo, tell me about your history, because you were born in Nigeria, you live in the States, you've gone Mm -hmm. via Sweden and Sierra Leone and all these different places. You do a lot of stuff on cross cultures now. So what's your journey and how do you describe to people what you do? Well, first of all, I always describe myself uh, as a walking contradiction. Uh, because I, I'm never what I appear. I, I, you're, you're right. I, I grew up as a Nigerian. That's the only passport that I have. But by the time I was 17, I had grown up in five countries and four continents. And, and that's because of my dad's job as a diplomat. Mm. But if you scale it back, you know, the first nine years of my life was spent in the military dictatorship. And I bring this point up because it would play a big role into what I do today. Because my first encounter with leadership was seeing people's lives uh, taken for not subscribing to a particular belief or being part of a certain tribe. And I just remember vividly 
experiencing that and thinking there's got to be more, right? There's got to be a better way to incorporate a bunch of people in a country that has 100, 250 ethnic groups and is the largest population-wise in Africa. We've got to find a way to work together. So that was implanted in my head. And then just as we transition into uh, civilian government in Nigeria, my dad started getting posted all over the place. And so now I was in Burkina Faso, which is a, a French-speaking country, but the, here's the situation. A skinny Nigerian kid with a very thick Nigerian accent in a French-speaking country in an American international school going through puberty. So in a place where I already, you know, everybody was already different, I felt different. And I just experienced leadership a certain way, and now I was wondering how to connect across cultures. Mm. And for me, this didn't just become like a, a thing to just think about. It was the way that I could make friends. It was the way that I could I could ask a girl out if I wanted. It was the way that I could succeed in school. And if I didn't know how to do that, um, I would have a miserable time. You know, oftentimes when you talk to people, they move a lot. They even they either have one or two experiences. One is they hated it, or the other is they loved it. So, um, yeah. So I, I I went through a series of, of steps and uh, and studying people from different backgrounds to understand the commonalities that existed within them, and then that sort of um, you know, helped me to become friends. And then I really just love traveling from then on. Um, and now it feeds into what I do, which is uh, I, I use my um, my podcast and company to help people redefine leadership today. As we see, it's very, very broken. And I do that mainly by fostering inclusion and showing people how to connect across cultures. Hmm. So, um, I mean, bearing in mind everything that you said, it must be massively, <laughs> I'm taking a bit of a punt here at guessing your <laughs> political persuasions, but it must be massively frustrating for you being so into leadership and togetherness and diversity and growth yeah. and looking after each other and tree hugging. You're a tree yet. hugger, don't worry about it. I am as well, that's fine. Um, but all of these wonderful, you know, tree hugging kind of <laughs> sentiments and then you have the leader that you do in the United States um, right. and, the, and the, the, the kind of the whole tone of leadership that that sets from the top down, from the leader of the country all the way down. How frustrating do you find that? It, it is it is it is incredibly frustrating. But, you know, and one of the things I'm a bit of an anomaly in the sense that I believe that us seeing these type of, of, of bad leadership examples gives humans an opportunity to to actually build the leader within them you know and and not rely on an old system where we felt like if once we have a leader we can quit and not develop ourselves i feel like now people can really work through frustrations and and things that have been you know internally held there was this phenomenon that just happened in this election here i mean i'm not a citizen so i can't vote but there was a lot of um uh, there were a lot of revelation about people saying, I didn't know that you were a Trump supporter or the hidden Trump voters. How did all these over 50 percent of people come about that weren't tracked in polls? And that to me was interesting because I was like, so how come all of these people didn't feel safe enough to say what they what they wanted to do until the election? And it's just really highlights what you were doing with the with the poop talk then is we don't <laughs> connect. A lot of us don't connect. A lot of us have used other forms of you know, digital platforms, and I love digital platforms, and we focused more on the, instead of using digital platforms to connect across cultures, we use that to just dive into our own world. So I'm excited about the potential of us. That's true, isn't it? You know, we can, like, we do rather get lost in our own world. And funnily yes. enough, I often find days off when I'm at home, are my least relaxing days because I'm so kind of frenziedly communicating with people on social media, but I'm not truly connecting with people um, out and about, whether it's at work or at an event or just out for lunch. If I'm in on my own on Facebook, that's not enjoyable or relaxing at all. It's just going within, as you say. Yeah, no, it's yeah. going within. So I'm, I, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. So I'm trying to, to get people to understand, okay, look, we have something that we need to fix, let's work together to fix that. Because now I think the situation that we have arise in in, um, in this country and many other countries are experiencing similar types of leadership is that they're starting to realize that the only way to actually succeed is if we figure out how to work together. Hmm. Because how are we go how else are we gonna actually get oh, to a place so where you, we can Yeah, but it's, that's, uh, I mean, I feel, you, you can't vote. And no, well, I can't vote for the president either. Yeah, I, I but he's either. still, his, his actions still impact us. Exactly. So um, can we influence that? 
what? Okay, so I'll tell you a story. This is um at the beginning of the year, right after election. I had um a very very uh, sweet little girl. Her name uh, we can't say the name, but she was 13, right? Um, I didn't know that 13 year olds even listened or read anything I did, but yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> I'd been invited to speak at a middle school, and she reaches out to me and says, "Dear Mr. Roxon, very formal." Um, you probably don't know me, but you've inspired me for the, for the longest time. And I am a little worried at the, the state of the world. I, I just came from the Women's March, and I am mm. a, a Latina. Um, I look white, but I'm Latina. And I don't feel like the school gives me a platform to fully represent myself. I feel like the country is taking and eating against my identity as a woman. And I get really worried about the shootings that happen for black people. Listening to your podcast and, and listening to your stories gives me hope that there is potential for me to actually find a place in this world. She's an American citizen. And it was, she said some other things. But she now felt inspired to start her, her own organizations around campus. And we've continued to stay in touch. And I was I reached out to her the other day. And she's in, in a new school. And she's leading this cross-cultural movement. And she's helping the curriculum change to have more Latina leaders. But that's what can happen from what you and I do, where you're inspiring people to understand that, okay, someone's not for us. We are going to be for ourselves. And yeah. she's a citizen. She, who's to say at 13 what she's going to do when she's 18 and who she's going to inspire by then? So yeah. that's why I have yeah. that I have. No, you're right. You're right. You're, you're changing my mind on the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's look at your business then. Um, you're, you're obviously very successful with your entrepreneurship. One of the things I know you're keen on is the importance of mentors. And I've always felt like um, it'd be quite nice to have a mentor, but I don't think I've got one. So, mm. so what's your experience with mentors? Uh, I, I think, I, you know, initially I was like, my mentors were always from afar, like Nelson Mandela, Oprah Winfrey. I was like, I'm going to be mentored from afar from by reading all your books. But I, I think mentors are key. Mentors for me have help, helped me with uh, self-awareness because sometimes when you're building a business, you can be in your own world. I'm a very stubborn person naturally. So sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm doing the right thing, whatever. But my blind spots <laughs> uh, sometimes with, with uh, mentors and coaches have, have been uh, been helped because I remember when I first started the business, um, I, I just – I my personality is I'm very welcoming, but I, I, w I couldn't say no. <laughs> and I would just say, no, we'll, we'll, we'll work together as business partners. And even though you don't have the skills, I will just overcompensate and you just understanding my mission is good enough. But it was actually detrimental to my business, and my I, I had to reach out to a mentor who, or sorry, a mentor reached out to me to say, if you continue to do this, you're going to lose every single thing that you you built. Really? Because yeah, because I you're you're not building a team to support you. You're building a team that sucks the life out of you, and that doesn't give you um, any time to to develop into the leader that you could be. And so for me, mentors have played a huge role in helping me point out blind spots and okay. helping. And, and how, how often would you sit down with you? So how many mentors do you have? Do you have like, because obviously it's some, you, you mentioned someone like Nelson Mandela. I get that, you know, like yeah. it, it's easy to take inspiration from people in the public yeah. eye. And you can learn a lot from just reading about people yeah. through books and so on. Yeah. But you presumably are talking about people who you actually have a relationship with who True. you speak to. Yeah, I have two. I have two that I, I, I can uh, firmly say, and we meet about once a month or so on the phone uh, for the most part because we're always in different locations. But yeah. um, uh, and funny enough, one of them actually, one of them reached out to me uh, as a listener to the podcast. So it, it's it's this is this is why I always say cool. don't underestimate telling your story. So it turns yeah. out, turns out I started this podcast because I wanted to bring people like myself who grew up in multiple cultures and help people embrace their global identity. I was sort of frustrated with the state of the world and said, no, there's something that we can help offer. And then it sort of turned into this thing where it's now, it's a business international entrepreneurship and things that really fosters um, ideas to disrupt the world and do good. But she um, found out that you know, through this in my podcast that she was a third culture kid. And for your audience, a third culture kid is anyone that spent the formative period of their lives outside of the parents' cultures. Okay. So they usually go by the term TCK or third culture kids. And that's like diplomatic kids, missionary kids, army brats, people that just sort of find themselves sure. traveling all over the world. So she was listening to an episode because I used the hashtag TCK and I just sort of did it on Twitter and maybe someone shared it to her. And she listened to the first few and she was like, I didn't know I was a third culture kid. I've been looking for years to figure out 
why I'm the way I am. I don't quite have a home everywhere. I never felt at home. But listen to your podcast gave me a home. And she's she's in her 40s, you know, and, and she was she was older than me. And I was like, man, I didn't realize that it it could reach, you know, that person. And she said, yeah. because of what you did for me, I want to help you out. And I want you to I want to see how you can turn this into a business. And she just proactively reached out to me because of she felt so connected to the story. So th- that was a mentor, and I, I, when I started the business, I had no business acumen. I mean, I was just running off passion. I mean, I, I didn't know, how to, I didn't know how to ask for anything or turn into money or leverage. I was just like, ah, kumbaya. <laughs> and and she was like, she was like, yeah, you know, this is a good idea to have, but you gotta learn some of the other <laughs> basics. Mm. So that's that's how it's been beneficial for me. So with mentors. Um, it's it is quite hard to find them and you've been very you've been really lucky with that particular mentor do you pay your mentors for their time wow yeah that is i have man huh. i don't know that i've paid there are a lot of coaches is coaching counted as mentor mentoring i, I don't I mean, know i guess it, it's it's however you want to define it but do yeah, you pay your mentors i don't pay my mentors no they, they so i've been fortunate in that but i, I know some people that there's like a paid mentorship program, you know, like um, put, even with us in our industry, podcast, a big podcaster would say uh, some something hundred dollars an hour or something like that for six months for me to mentor you. But I've never paid my mentor. No. How much? I've never paid a mentor. No, but, <laughs> but, no, but have, what were you saying? A podcast, a big podcaster. How much yeah, would they like, want to no, charge? No, John Lee Dumas. John Lee oh, John... Dumas is like fifteen hundred or something like that. I, I can't remember the, the exact oh, number. No. But it was some number, I remember. Well, yeah, he uh, would charge 1500 to mentor you. Uh, I, I, it's, I've never done it. You know so what I, I reckon? Know, but... Keep your money in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but, um, uh, yeah, but he's, uh, he's definitely, or someone in that vein has done that. But I don't know. I think I'm just, I would not charge people because I've reached, many people have reached out to me to mentor them. And I just do that based on the time I have and I don't even think about charging them because to mm. me I'm but but you're you're I, a you're a considerate man you love yeah, to yeah. spread the yeah. love and like not, I said uh, you know, my <laughs> to, she works with me on this I it's to my detriment sometimes I might be too nice of a person to understand the benefit of that so mm. I should ask you the question do you do you pay for people to be to be mentored under you no I don't and you know one of the things we we obviously spoke about NLP quite a bit on your show and um, one of the things that is great about NLP is learning from uh, people that do things well and taking what might work from them and cherry picking the best bits and applying it to your own life. And there are certain skills within NLP that work very well for that. And especially, for example, when I got the, the job at the TV station here in London, I did that a lot. I basically picked the presenter that I thought was best learn yeah. all about him, learn what he did well, even down to the things like how he dresses, which makes me sound like a bit of a stalker. But <laughs> I, you know, I didn't know what to do. I wasn't on TV at that point. I didn't know how to, like, you know, tie a tie. I even, you know, I mean, so you kind of got to w- learn these things, the, the, the basic things like behavior and environment, but also values and beliefs. So in that respect, that's been really helpful. And I've learned from people in the public eye. Do I have a mentor? No. I do have people I look up to. But um, I have used various coaches in the past, but I've always paid for it. Um, yeah, and that's been great. And I guess yeah, if you're I've not lucky enough, too. yeah, if you're not lucky enough to have a mentor, maybe a coach would be a good way to go and you could do that yeah. instead and you, you pay for yeah. it. But um, yeah. but one way or the other, I think you're absolutely right. You know, having people around you, I mean, I'm very lucky that I've got one of my best friends runs quite a big um, uh, record label in in on my street <laughs> and he's a great sounding board and he won't give it much time but i'll say what do you think of this and he'll be like nah <laughs> but um <laughs> but sometimes that that's all it needs you know so i'm lucky like that yeah that's yeah. good it's good and you should read the book mastery if you haven't read it by robert green ah um, now that's it because one of the questions in the podcast is what is one book that you'd recommend so you've just come to that a little bit earlier why is this such a good book oh, mastery's genius Mastery is yeah. genius, Tony. It, t- it talks about this. This all we just talked about the fact that um, mentorship can be beneficial. And he, what he's doing is he's, he's exploring some of the greatest masters in the world, from Leonardo da Vinci to, to now in current day. And he talked about how they went through apprenticeship 
And some of it was through having direct mentors. Some of it wasn't through having direct mentors. And and ta- he outlines ways they hacked their way into eventually becoming better than their masters. Wow. Uh, and and it is a fascinating read. I, I read it as much as I can. And so um, I, when you said that, it just reminded me of that because a lot of times people say I'm not in the place where I can just easily call Elon Musk or anything. But he talks about how – well. Who says you have to call Elon Musk? There are ways you can hack that experience and be mentored from afar. So it's great. Yeah, that's really cool. You know what? We're getting into some serious depth now. We started off talking about poop tweeting, but we're now on to uh, Mastery by Robert Greene. This is, <laughs> this is excellent. Because he's the guy who wrote 48 Laws of Power, isn't he? That's the exact guy. It's the same guy. And, and uh, Seduction or something. The Art of Yeah, seduction. The Art of Seduction, yeah. which is quite a controversial book. It is, even though the Forty Eight Laws of Power. He, uh, uh, he, he, I think he enjoys sparking <laughs> controversy. Mastery is probably his tamest book. <laughs> really? So, yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, but you deal with persuasion, so this is probably something you love doing. Yeah, the art of seduction. Uh, uh, the, well, no, not the art of seduction, Ty. I've got a girlfriend. <laughs> I think we well, need to probably make that quite clear. <laughs> um, but the, what, what I remember was interesting about 48 Laws of Power is, and I think um, it's written like this kind of ancient, mystical, old text that has been discovered from the valleys within. And actually, he's still alive and he's just written it and it's brilliantly written, but it's not ancient in any way. Am I right about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, that I don't know. I wish I did. Yeah. That, that's... <laughs> that accent you were doing is something I'm still hung up on. I've got to see that accent. <laughs> <laughs> Mystery go on. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't, don't quite know where that accent came from, but <laughs> Ma- Mastery sounds really good. I'm actually just having having a look online. Yeah. Move toward resistance and pain. Apprentice yourself in failure. And these are all lessons from people who've been successful. Yeah. 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 Wow. So is that something that you kind of, I'm a massive book geek and I do, I do find that for relaxation, I love fiction and for learning, I love nonfiction. Um, I do find it quite hard to go back to books again and again. I get, um, I will highlight passages and I'll go back to those passages, but to reread a whole book, um, and I'll tell you one book I'm thinking of. I don't know if you've read Neil Strauss's latest book, The Truth. Um, oh no I haven't it's on yeah. my list though yeah it's, it's on my list I mean there's a seduction theme creeping in here now because we've, not only <laughs> we've been talking about the art of seduction he was obviously the author of the game and then he wrote this book 10 years later called The Truth which was kind of like the anti-game um, and uh, I definitely recommend it it's a very thoughtful book and it's quite entertaining as well and I couldn't read it again it's like I knew I knew what had happened I couldn't do that um, yeah. so so how do you do that so I'll tell you what, I know you do a lot of uh, audiobooks. Audiobooks is the way for me right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I, I read uh, um, often, but I find that I, re- I listen to way more audiobooks. And, and I try to take advantage of those moments where I'm in New York. You're walking on the street. You're doing the laundry. You're on the subway. And, you know, I, I read it at a two times speed or three times speed oh yeah now, yeah that's brilliant that's such yes. a good device a lot of people don't know that exists but you can just yeah. click a button and it'll play at 1.5 or 2 or 2.5 or 3 and it sounds a bit weird but you, you get the whole thing don't you yeah you get used to it and then so now that you know a book that would take me eight hours like consuming and for a book like that i love like um the alchemist which is a very short read you know you can do that almost basically every day and since we are podcasters and i <laughs> and you people say mm. you listen to podcasts an audiobook is just that way. So I've hacked the experience in my head where I just see it as a podcast and I'm taking and retaking information every day. So if I'm reading at two, three, two, three times the speed, I'm not spending as much time as I normally would think that I would spend. And so that that makes it easy. You know, J.K. Rowling's one of my favorite authors. I do that with, with her books. Um, pa- uh, Paulo Coelho. Um, for the alchemist and obviously mastery so yeah yeah oh, that's awesome yeah i've definitely i've never used that i've used it once or twice but i think especially for audiobooks that's a great way to get through something a little bit quicker yeah. Yeah. um right. excellent work now what about um intuition and going in your gut feeling and following your gut i know you've spoken about this as well and this is always something that i've got a bit of a problem with <laughs> in that probably i don't 
I'm not very good at it. I like to be analytical. And I think that many of my successes have not come from following my gut, but quite the opposite. Um, so it's something that I could probably learn from you about. And in general, I probably would be like to be better at following my intuition. So tell me a little bit about how you follow your gut. So I told you the story about me being 10 years old and saying, I want to change the world by bringing people across cultures. Yeah. And then I, I graduated from college and I somehow fell into this curse of being realistic. <laughs> and the, the realistic, the, I, being realistic basically is the world telling you that you can't do this because you this. So my thing was, the fixed mindset was you, you have a four, you're a foreigner, you're an international student. What are you going to do? You can't, what, build something here? You got to have an H-1B visa. And so I was like, all right, yeah, you're right. You know, and applying to over 85 jobs and them all saying no also sort of confirmed that in my head. They're like, okay, I've applied to over 85 jobs. They said no. I'm just going to take whatever job gives me an offer. And it ended up being a sales job that I, I didn't think was a sales job when I took the job. Oh. And so now I had a So presumably for, a job you didn't really want. Oh, no, it was definitely a job I didn't want, but I thought I was going to do social media. And then they come to me and say, you're doing sales okay. and you have to make $10,000 a month. And that's your quota. So I was like, great, whatever. Um, and then I, I just sort of fell into that spell. Like, I've got to be analytical and all that. And, uh, and then a couple things happened. I woke up in cold sweats one, one morning, around 2, 3 in the morning. And I was like, I can't believe this is going to be the next 60 years of my life. And I was like, man, I feel like I cheated myself. And I went back to sleep because I wasn't brave enough to do anything. I, in my gut feeling, I knew that I really should just do something with media and and telling stories but yeah, i felt like yeah it didn't matter and then nothing happened I, I, I came to new york i love i, I love sports you we expressed that i'm a huge man U fan but yeah. uh, basketball basketball is my game like, yeah uh, i'm very disappointed about you being a huge man united yeah, fan but yeah, you know, dwight york <laughs> david beckham ryan giggs except when giggs when giggs isn't doing things with his brother's wife but um which is still disappointing but uh <laughs> i digress um but yeah, basketball. Basketball is my favorite sport. So I went to, to watch a game and uh, I – oh, sorry, what? Yeah, carry on. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, I went to watch a game and it was in the city. I was like, oh, I'm going to use the basketball game to watch uh, – to explore New York City. And I felt so alive, Tony. I felt like, oh, my goodness. Whatever it is about the city, there's an energy here. I was living in a college town. Nothing mm. happened. And now there's a lot of activity. So it just implanted in my head that maybe if I ever had the guts – to move this would be the city and then the kick off and the wake up moments of wake up moments happened a couple months after that i was driving to work to this place of employment that i didn't quite like and all of a sudden my lane gets cut into half and so i'm swerving to not get hit and then i hit the left guardrail and the right guardrail boof, boof. And then I hit one car and then two cars and back to left guardrail and then uh, uh, the third car. And then my car lifts up mm. and it's about to flip over the bridge. I'm 22 years old and I'm saying to myself, um, only one thing, one thought comes to mind. Have you done everything you said you were going to do? And I obviously couldn't answer that question with a yes. So I slammed the brakes as, you know, as hard as I could and somehow was able to get out of that car and not flip over the bridge. But my car was totaled. Uh, completely in complete ruins, shambles, mm. and two other cars were hit. And um, I just really became intimately aware of my mortality. I was like, what, have I, what am I waiting for? Like, I almost just died now, and I didn't do anything. And it's because I created this safe spaces for myself. So I quit that job, despite the fact that I have, uh, I knew that I only... So that, that was, really encouraged you to follow your guy. Oh, goodness, yeah. I was like, I, I, I almost died and I didn't feel like I had any I, I had any contribution to the world. And so I quit wow. the job knowing that the visa was the only thing keeping me here. And I just moved to New York City. And I said, I'll figure it out by going to another school because that would give me a visa. And I just made New York City my campus. And I started, I launched a podcast and I started creating these type of stories. And... I, throughout my experience in New York City, I've been broke, fired twice, I uh, owed the IRS, but the interesting thing, I built a successful company. And all that happened from following the guts. Mm. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not listening anymore to all that. And, you know, there's nothing that happens when you play small. So I just really had to step into that. Yeah. And, so really, that, that is play, listening to your gut. And yeah. um, 
it's not always easy for someone who is kind of a bit analytical and an overthinker like me. And yeah. perhaps you do sound like, a, you know, you're quite kind of, you sound quite easygoing, quite happy, even when we were talking about Trump on your podcast and on mine. You don't seem to get that, you, you, your, your message is an essentially positive one. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think about, you know, and I, you know, obviously your big thing is leadership. I yeah. look at the leadership, political leadership around the world, and I despair. Yeah. How do you remain? And I and I analyze it, and I think about it. And I think this is just a nightmare. So how do you yeah. remain positive? But you know the thing is, I, I get angry a lot. But I, there, it's one of your, one of my favorite people is uh, is actually one of your fellow country ladies is uh, Emma Watson, and she she had a talk. On, you I really are a big Harry Potter fan, aren't you? Oh my goodness, I'm a, I'm a Ravenclaw. I'm I'm so I've been. Sorted in the sorting that I have my 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 wand and my Patronus. You really? Don't get, you don't want to get me started on this. I am a nerd in anything Harry Potter. That's, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I like you all the more for this because I think it's like, you know, it's, it's a brave, red-blooded man who admits to being a huge Harry Potter oh, nerd. Yes, yes. Mm. I'm em- this is my masculinity and I embrace it and this is <laughs> keep defining it. Yes, I love sports as much as I love Harry Potter. But but she says something. She says something when she was talking about gender equality, which is obviously something that I care about, being diverse and inclusion. And she just ended the, the statement with, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? And that's that's what I think about all the time because I've spent a lot of time being angry and complaining, but I'm like, man, you know, there is something that I can do today to better one person's life. And there is something that I can do now, me intimately knowing that I almost died, if not now, then when? Like, we keep yeah. thinking that we have more time than we do, and we complain more than we should. And if we substituted those types of thinking with, well, what is one good thing I could do today? And how can I maximize my time? We would be infinitely more successful. Mm. And so that's what I try to spend my time doing uh, with, with whatever I do. Good uh, on you. But yeah. yeah. But hey, but look, th- it, it is not easy. It is so much easier to... To complain, it's easier to to hate. It's easier to to be any any ism because that's a, an easier emotion. Loving is so much harder because you have yeah. to overcome the fact that someone could just be rude to you or be bad to you, and you still have to love them. And that that's that's harder. So I understand mm. it. They might be rude about your Harry Potter. Um, oh yeah, I I get it from all angles. The Manchester United, the Harry <laughs> Potter. But, you know, you know when I think of that. Harry Potter, I just I can't quite bring myself to get fully involved in those books. I think I might have seen one of the I, movies. You're in the, the, the I can't believe you it's don't all, listen like, to Harry It's all Potter. this kind of, you know, all wispy kind of fantasy and there's like creatures with one eye and all that kind of thing. I just can't be bothered. <laughs> um have you seen this, this there's this film that's out at the moment called Mother? Um, I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, it's, it's it's actually called Mother Exclamation Mark. And it's like, it's a kind of, it's a bit more adult than Harry Potter, to be honest. Um, it's very adult from what I've heard. <laughs> yeah, it's a kind of horror thriller. But it's supposed to be, but you know, bearing in mind, we're just talking about how some people love stuff and some people don't. It is yeah. supposed to be a film that some people think is unbelievably good but some people think is the worst movie possibly of all time. <laughs> um, it's what's called a Marmite film. Um, and uh, maybe that's the same for Harry Potter as well. But Yeah, no, I, I, the, I've heard the exact same things about Mother. It's Some people are like, what would did I just watch? That seems incredibly... Yeah, because my girlfriend was like, start- look at this trailer. It looks amazing. She showed it to me yesterday. She said, do you want to go and see this next week? And I, I couldn't even watch to the end of the trailer. I had to say, <laughs> actually, I don't think I can watch it. It looks so bad. And I hate <laughs> films like this anyway. I just don't yeah. think I can do it. <laughs> well, yeah, no, that, 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 that's so funny. No, but no, that's, that's, it's, it's interesting though how we both have different philosophies on that. But that's, that's what I ended up doing. You know, my experience as that kid who felt inferior in those different environments because mm. he had to be different versions of, of someone else so that he could meet the expectations of other people. I overcame that growing up in all these cultures. And then yeah. I, I, I actually love the expressions that you give. Because I people are always confused. They're like, oh, yeah, you're a typical quote-unquote guy because you, you can speak to any sport and you love sports and you play and you're, you're physical, you work out. And then I switch on the, oh, I, I just watched the, the Notebook or I love the Nicholas Sparks or I'm yeah. doing all that. They're like, who are you? How do you I love that. Me? 
Yeah. yeah. And, and you know and what? Then, then you start to see, d- discover yeah. people's eccentricities and individualities and, and, yeah. what, and they're confident enough to be into yeah. what they're into. And that is yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Mm. That's awesome. Listen, something I ask everyone, Tayo, is what is one book you recommend? You've done that already. And what is one tip you'd give for living with more energy, vitality and motivation? So it can be anything. You're obviously a very energized, passionate person anyway. What is your yeah. one tip for energy? Oh, man, man. Wow. What is one tip? I mean, so, when you live at your to, best to... and, and with, when you have the most energy, what is it that you're doing well? You know, I don't want to say the typical thing like work out because I believe that is do that. But I think practicing gratitude daily. So this is what I mm. do every I try to do it. I haven't done it in the last couple of days, which makes me sad. But I um, <laughs> whenever I wake up, I try to, you know, uh, I try to write things that I want, I'm going to be grateful for for the day. And then when, I, when I'm going to bed, I reflect on everything I was actually grateful for for that day. And the only reason I'm doing this is just to stay in a positive mindset because we do live in a lot of negative mindset. So even if it's like, um, uh, I, you know, I, I helped uh, my brother, I sent my brother a funny video or I practiced my daily, I met my daily quota of putting a smile on five people's faces. That I have a daily quota of doing that. Yeah. Or I told my mom I love, I love her. Just those things keep me and remind me of the, the things that are good in life. Mm-hmm. And whenever I feel like I'm, in, I'm reminded of the things that are good in life, I'm actually more energized to continue to, to either expand that those things that are good in my life or um, make sure that I appreciate the people more around me. Yeah. So just practicing that gratitude, it's as simple as that. Um, yeah. yeah you're you're a nice man, Tayo. You really are. Telling your mum you love her, that is just nice. You're a nice chap. Hey, we don't do it. I don't do it enough. She gets, but you know, I just yeah. I do that. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, seriously, it's been really good to talk to you and it was really fun coming on your podcast as well. So thank you. Um, Thank you. And where can people find out more about everything you're doing, the cross culture work you're doing, your business, and your podcast as well? It is all at the digital home of tyroxin.com. So T A Y O R O C K S O N.com. And um, yeah, I mean, the podcast, I, I'm getting ready to launch a program on being a thought leader and speaking and audiences. So everything that I'm doing will be on the site. But um, I, I'm, I'm a friendly guy i love talking to people so tie rocks and everyone on social media uh I, I don't have i'm not fortunate to have one of those fancy names that people can they have i might underscore something something it's just tie rocks and so uh, that's good. you're the only tire rocks around that's great that's exactly I'm what you want to be <laughs> yeah you're not tire rocks and you know one four seven two three that's brilliant um <laughs> <laughs> listen thank you so much for coming on and hope to speak to you again Likewise, man. Likewise. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. Yeah. That's it for this week's Zestology from an echoey flat here in central London. Uh, As always, really appreciate you listening to the podcast. If you do like books and you like the book element of the podcast, remember there's a Zestology book club now, which is um, which has got a loyal, a small but loyal following. I like to call it an almost secret book club. And that means that it's um, the small amount of members in it doesn't look quite so ridiculous. (laughs) No, it's growing. It's growing quite quickly, actually. And if you'd like to be a member of the book club, you can be. And uh, just just, uh, find it on Facebook and come and join it. So that's the Zestology Book Club. This is the podcast. Very excitingly, I'm going to do what I did in the last couple of years over the next few weeks, and that is have a Christmas special with some of the highlights of the year, some of my highlights in terms of interviews and also things that I've done as well. Um, So that's going to be coming up. Might even do a top 10 of favourite interviews throughout the year. We'll see about that. As always, thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time.